Good evening. Welcome to the March edition of the Author Showcase Series and Virtual Experience. I'm Evelyn Benson, Vice President, Current Treasurer, and host of this program for members of the South Florida Writers Association, a nonprofit organization supporting writers and the literary arts. Tonight, we will showcase author Catherine Shields discussing her book, Shape of Normal, a memoir of motherhood, disability, and embracing a different kind of perfect. Cassie's book was named a category winner in the 2023 American Writing Awards. And her writing has been nominated twice for a Pushcart Award. In fact, she won the South Florida Writers Association Book Publishing Grant in 2022. Personally, her book resonates with me because it's about parenting, unconditional love, and lessons of acceptance. So watch and listen. Better still, read her book. Catherine Shields is a retired educator with an MS Ed in Exceptional Education, whose experience includes networking and dealing with children and families of persons with disabilities. Her essays have been published in NBC Today, Newsweek, Bacopa Literary Review, Grown and Flown, Brevity Blog, Mother Magazine, You Revolution, and Right City Magazine. So fellow writers, readers, parents, and friends, join me in giving a warm round of applause for author Catherine Shields. I'm Catherine Shields, the author of the book, The Shape of Normal. And I'm here to talk about the book that I recently published. Um, it came out in November and it's a memoir. The subtitle of my book is a memoir of motherhood, disability, and embracing a different kind of perfect. Um, I've been a writer, writer uh, for about 15 years. I've been writing um, and I wrote this book uh, because I had to write it. Um, I've been published in magazines such as Gravity Blog, um, NBC Today, Newsweek, the Copa Literary Review, um, Grown and Flown, lots of magazines that publish stories about motherhood and um, seeking self, you know, self-realization, because that's kind of what I write about. Um, I'm exploring those kinds of themes. And I live in Miami. Um, I've been married for a, quite a long time, number of years. I have three children and four grandchildren. And um, I like to kayak and uh, I like to ride my bike. And that's who I am. Um, I don't know what uh, um, I guess I should start talking about my book a little bit then, huh? <laughs> Okay, you want to hear about it? I'm going to tell you about, well, first I want to tell you about who I am. Um, now, I certainly didn't set out to write this book, but I began journaling. I was teaching for many years. I was a kindergarten teacher. And I would write in the afternoons about the things that were happening in my family life at home in my off time after my students would uh, leave and go home. And I would write about the frustrations that I had faced. Um, I kept going and getting, digging deeper and deeper. And I started to see, I had a whole facet of emotions I wanted to write about. And I started writing about scenes, something maybe that happened at the dinner table the night before. And I really wanted to remain authentic. Um, people that have read my book are usually are stating things like uh, very authentic, very honest, very real. They feel like they're sitting in the living room talking to me. Um, 
it might sound like a cliche, but I believe that love was like the guiding force to writing what I ended up doing, writing this book. And it's a book about dealing with my daughter who has an intellectual disability. Um, as I said, I have three children. She's one of them. She's one of the twins. And it was really difficult to, uh, to, to raise a kid like this. And it was challenging. And I think I had to struggle and that should the daughter is now in her forties, but she um she lives in a group home and I just had to tell the story so other parents could hear that it's okay to feel all the different emotions that you might feel when you're when you're dealing with this kind of situation. I thought this was a good thing to do. And it took um as far as writing, it took a number of years to get the book finished. And it took about two or three more years to actually get a publisher to publish it. Um, and I, I want to tell people that want to set out to, to, to write. My advice is always don't quit. Just don't give up and keep going and it will happen. But um, um, let me think. What else can I say about my book? I have some notes when I get my notes. When my daughter was five years, almost five years old, about to go into kindergarten, she, um, we were told something very disturbing by a neuropsychologist in one of the um, centers that was evaluating her. Uh, I knew that she had uh, developmental delays and she had gone into an early intervention program when she was very young. At, at three years old, you're allowed to come into that kind of program in public school. And we thought she was just very, very delayed. Her diagnosis initially was that she had cerebral palsy. And that's, that's it. it seemed like something easy to deal with. You can get, I didn't really understand what cerebral palsy was. Remember, this is 40 years ago. The, the, my daughter is now 40. Um, and I wrote the book starting when she was an infant to when she was uh, 20, 28 years old. But I thought it was a simple case of cerebral palsy. We can get therapy. Everything's going to be fine. But I kept hearing, I didn't know cerebral palsy also affected, it could affect. It doesn't always. It can, it can manifest different ways. And it can affect your intelligence. And she had scored low on her IQ test. Um, and later, when she was about to go into kindergarten, that's what I was going to talk about, is I was told... And this is the words that were used in 1985, profoundly retarded. She's profoundly retarded. Now, a parent hearing that kind of news, it's going to be pretty taken aback and shocked by hearing that the word and that phrase. Um, but I I responded with, um, no, this is not happening. This is not true. This is, they're wrong. And it took me many years to really recover and work my way to complete acceptance. And my my book is really about that journey of acceptance, of learning that uh, I, I had to understand that my daughter was not the one who needed to change, that it was me, that I had to accept and change my attitude and see, see what I hadn't seen. Because uh, I was expecting this perfect life. Everything was going to be exactly the way I wanted life to work out. And when it didn't, it, it I wasn't prepared. I was, you know, I guess I was 20, I was 30, 30 when she was born. That's not that old, but it's still, looking back, I see how how um, naive I was. But um, I was adamant that I could change this outcome to my daughter's diagnosis. And to anyone who was looking from the outside in, they would have thought, this is not making any sense, lady. But I was determined, and my determination fueled my my anger and fueled my determination to fix it and so it, that's why it did take quite a while um so I was in state of denial for a long time and I guess when I when my daughter was moving into middle school that's when I began to realize this is what we've got and started to look at myself and perhaps my ableist attitudes about my daughter um so it was hard having two other children that were so-called normal, 
but um, it was a struggle, but we, we, we got through it. And sometimes I've been asked, where'd you get the title for your book? Where'd you get the name Shape of Normal? And it comes from seeing the bell curve that the neuropsychologist show, showing me. He's showing me this bell curve and he's telling me the words profoundly retarded. Your daughter's at the far left end of this bell curve, which means her IQ is like so 40, 38, 40. And normal is right in the center at the very top of that bell curve. And I was like, no, we're going to get her up there, Rachel, get, get her to reach the middle. And it looked like a, a shape of a bell. And so I thought that's really what the, the whole story was about, is about looking at that and just wrestling with that idea of how am I going to get her to be normal? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? I, I really believed I did. So uh, that's where where I wrote, where, where I came from when I was writing this book. Um, I would like to also have people that read my book, I hear the message that um, she's really not so different. She's more alike than different. She's, we're all human beings. And I think... I would like to spread the word to the world if I can, or somehow be an advocate for people with disabilities so that we start seeing it more as someone inclusive, inclusivity and someone who belongs with all of us. We all have differences. And I, you know, as I said, I struggled. It wasn't easy when I first learned that my child was going to be this different person. And she didn't look that different. Um, I, physically, she was a very attractive kind of person. Very, I mean, that's just who she was. She was very cute and uh, didn't physically manifest. The cerebral palsy was very mild. It was her, mostly her speech was affected and her gait. So it was hard to reconcile that, um, that int intellectually she was going to be really limited. But she's come really far, and today she is, she is not going to be able to drive a car or live independently, but she's come much farther than I ever expected when I was told that that phrase, uh, profoundly retarded. I, I can't believe that this was said, but that was, that was acceptable, and that was even in the uh, D, DSMD, I think it's the Diagnostic... Uh, you know, this is psychologist used this, what the manual is called. I always, I always forget that part. Um, and so I had a lot of wrestling to do with what is, what defined normal. And I also felt judged by people when I would go out with her. Um, I think it was difficult to, um, to feel like I was accepted. And really it was not just a struggle with, is my, is my daughter uh, acceptable. It was more of a struggle with myself also as well. Um, cause growing up, I felt like I was not, um, uh, let's say fully accepted by my parents who, who were kind of quiet and introverted and it didn't help that I was shy. And, um, so when I became a parent, I thought, Oh, um, I'm going to have these really great kids. And, <laughs> everybody's going to be fine and I'm going to make sure everybody's liked and, and uh, accepted. But I still had issues. I think that I didn't, I had to reflect on anyway. Um, many people don't voice that many parents, that parents of children, particularly children with differences, they don't um, voice these things. The way I've written my book is, I'm, I wasn't afraid to really just let it all out and, you know, say, this is who I am and stand up and be open, like re uh, reveal everything I felt, um, the anger, the frustration. Um, so I thought I could share my truth and I'm not ashamed of sharing it. And I felt like I was really helped by my daughter that she 
taught me so many things and helped me shift my perspective. And I call her, we call it our book. Whenever she goes with me to a book launch or some kind of book talk, um, she says, I love our book. <laughs> um, anyway, I had to learn to see that it wasn't her that was not, it wasn't her that was broken, so-called broken, that I was never the, on a hero's journey to save her, that really I had to make the shift, as I said, inside myself. Mm. And I can talk about the, the, the book at why I wrote it. I, as I said, I wrote it in response to those years of hearing that, that phrase and they say, write what you know. So it was easy to, to write what I know and write my own story. Cause, um, I, I was very familiar with it and I didn't know exactly what, what kind of sh <laughs> shape the book would end up taking. I didn't think about fictional, fictionalizing it because I was living this every day. So I wanted to vent and writing it was very therapeutic. Um, I felt tortured. So it was tortured by denial, by, by frustration, by guilt. So when I started releasing this and writing this as a memoir, I thought this is kind of fun. This is, I mean, not fun, but a, a release. And I was, and a, and a challenge. And then I also started to learn the practice of writing well and explaining my story so people could relate. Um, I took a lot of writing classes. Um, and one more thing I have to say about writing this particular book, it was hard to, um, to think about it or to raise a child like this. And it's still hard to parent a unique child, but I think one can live with contradictions because that's part of life. And um, mom, can, <laughs> um, anyway, as I said, when, when I first introduced myself, that many of the stories and essays I write about are about that same subject. Um, I find it's easy to go, oh, I can write about this happen or, she came home this weekend. This is what happened. And um, one of the things that was the hardest to do when we were, when my daughter was growing up was taking her on family vacations because she did not like flying on planes and she would get hysterical on takeoff and throw up and cry, scream hysterically. Can you imagine being on an airplane and everybody's looking at you and your kid is screaming? So... Um, I used to, I, I, I would try to get babysitters to leave her at home. And, uh, when she was around 28, she did move into a group home. And then one year we were on vacation and hurricane, it wasn't hurricane Andrew cause that happened. We were here, but it was another hurricane that was coming barreling in. It was about 10 years ago. And the group home calls and says, well, if we have to evacuate and go to a shelter, that's what we're going to do in case we get the orders to evacuate. I had never, I, I, I spent the whole entire camping trip upset. We were camping on that vacation, upset, trying to call, then the phones wouldn't work. And then my cell phone kept dying. It was, I was tortured all over again. I, I worried the entire time we were away. And then we had the pandemic. <laughs> Then we had that and she got sick with COVID and I, I, I couldn't figure out whether to bring her home or keep her at the group home or what to do. And I don't think I'll ever get over the struggle, the, the struggle that every parent of a special needs child has to uh, handle. I, I don't know if I'll ever be okay with it, but as I said, there, there's contradictions. We can live with them. And I, I certainly hope my book reaches that audience that would need to hear what I'm what I have to say. Well, um, I always believed in trying to help children learn to be autonomous. Now there is a push now for inclusion, people with um who have disability, intellectual disabilities, or any kind of disabilities. 
disabilities. Everybody should be all classified and grouped in. We should all include everybody. I don't really know that I believe that, especially, I think it's a case by case situation. I don't think my daughter would have thrived had I put her in an, uh, in, in an inclusive class without, um, uh, I thought, I thought she didn't need to be in the, with the rest of the population. I thought she should be with the population of people that were like her peers. And I think that it, it, in my case, that this is the right thing to do. But I always wondered if it was the right thing to do. She had a twin sister. Her twin sister did not go to the same school she went to. And my daughter, her name is Jessica. She went to like five or six different schools because they kept moving around thinking, I'm going to, remember, I'm going to fix this. Until she was about 12 or 13, I'm going to, I'm going to get this fixed. I'm gonna. And then when I started to realize it was not going to get fixed, I, um, I started to say, well, at least I can get her to go as far as she can. You know, she couldn't read, but she could recognize signs like signs for the grocery store, like Publix. Or uh, the other day we were at Coral Reef Park and she pointed to the signs. They, was, they were having a, a camping day and she pointed to a sign that said, that's a zoo. She, so she recognized the word zoo. She recognized the word pizza. Um, cause there was like signs for this, this, uh, center over here is having pizza. This and over here, they're having a petting zoo. And I was like, wow. I mean, sh she's still showing me she can learn. She's still showing me she can grow. Um, and I, and I, 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 I sometimes feel like I don't give her enough credit. Um, and anyway, I think there's room for everyone at the table. I think she enjoys being with the family, enjoys doing certain things. Certainly not traveling on an airplane, but like going out, she loves shopping and she loves going out to eat. Um, and so she's she's, an, she's a wonderful person to have. And as again, I've got to say, she's taught me so much about, about being a person. Um, and I also want to talk about how I think when people see someone who's disabled in the, in the community, that they feel sorry for they look away and they feel sorry for the individual or the family. And I felt, I didn't like that. I hated that. I thought, I hated hearing that I was being admired. Oh, I admire you. You're so strong. I didn't want pity. I, I wanted support. And I wanted somebody to just said, I understand it's really hard. I didn't want her to be different, but she was. And I was ashamed of admitting that um, I felt bad about it because it seemed so self-centered. And I think there's a lot of families who have it much worse than I did. Um, certainly my daughter, you know, uh, has lots more ability than some. Um so I wanted to share my truth, as I said, and I'm unashamed of sharing. And I'm, I'm really proud of myself that I um, overcame these ableist attitudes. Um, sometimes I've been asked about what my other family members have re react, how they've reacted to my writing about them and using their names. And I, I asked them for permission for, can I use your names? What do you want me to change your name? You know, everything most writers would probably, if they were writing a memoir or a nonfiction story about their own family would ask. And they were supportive about it. They said, go ahead, use my name. Um, they've been very supportive about my project. They've read versions of the book, even contributed their input. Or if I said, I thought this happened and they correct me. Um, my oldest said, oh, she'd be famous. She could Google herself. And, the, and then the twin sister said, well, maybe. And she had second thoughts, but then she said, go ahead. It doesn't matter. But I tried in my writing with memoir to respect everyone's privacy. And I told them in some cases I compressed or changed some of the scenes just to make, just for the to make it, uh, build it into a better scene for, for the writing purposes, you know, for, 
uh, for brevity. And I wasn't, I didn't necessarily list every single episode or incident that got them in trouble during their adolescent years, but I used a few and it, you know, it caused a little friction. Like, what'd you write that for? I, I told them over and over when I was writing the book though, you got to look at it before it's published. No, it's, it's out. It's too late. Um, so But many, many parents, as I, I'm going to go back to the parents that, are, that I'm writing this book for, there were so many emotions that I had to wrestle with. And I think everyone would probably nod their head in relation. Yep, guilt. Yep, guilt and grief. Um, because you start out with, st when you're starting how, having a family, you have this picture in your mind of how everything's, exactly how everything's going to look and how it's going to be. And it didn't when it didn't go the way I had planned, um, I I would feel angry, and sometimes these emotions would sneak up on me at the most inopportune times. Um, um, back to talking about being a writer, though, because we're talking. I'm talking to South Florida Writers Association. Um, I think that one of the biggest pieces of advice I give other people who ask me, and I'm not an expert, this is my first book, but is don't give up and focus on your goal and, and your belief that you have a story worth telling. Um, I sent over 130 queries, which is please, please publish my book. <laughs> That's what a query is. Uh, when you write a letter to a press or an agent and say, um, you know, I hope you'll be interested, whatever you say. There's, there's lots of different ways to write a query. And I remember early on, there was something called Pitch Wars. And I sent this pitch out with another writer friend and she got a request for her manuscript and I didn't. And I was like, kind of angry and kind of envious. And, and then I was ashamed of myself for being envious of somebody else, not happy for them, but like, oh, you got it. And I didn't. Um, but I just kept going. And and now we're both published authors and it's fine. But, you know, it's just a, a lot of a lot of detours with it, with this process of trying to get just get a single thing published. This was really hard. I think my list of just short stories, I have 200 uh, that I have submitted, and I think I have twenty one that were have been accepted over the over the years. Um, but as far as my book, when I was getting down to okay, one hundred and thirty queries, I wasn't getting anywhere. What finally put me over the top and got my book, and I got two offers actually from two small presses, um, was I found the right editor. Uh, I, I was asking people. I have. I'm in all. Um, a lot of different groups on Facebook called the binders, binders seeking literary agents, binders seeking um, small small presses, binder. There's a lot of groups called binders of, and then it's got something to do with writing. So they said, um, send out, just send out queries, send out lots of queries. And then I finally said, well, can somebody help me with my, uh, figure out what's wrong with my book, my manuscript, because I keep getting no. I mean, after a hundred and something times, you're going to say, well, something's wrong with it. So I that led me to this amazing editor. And I had no idea that an editor could be that powerful. Actually wrote an essay about the power of the editor and got it published in Brevity blog um, about what happened when I finally did hire her. And I was astounded that it costs so much. I mean, it's not cheap. I mean, she was, I think her, I think her charge was over a hundred something an hour, uh, an hour. Yeah. She charged by the hour. Some, some of them charged by the, by the, by the, um, by the job. This one charged by the hour. I think it was 135 an hour. My, my daughter, one of my daughters, one of my older daughters said, you should just do it because this is your, your last chance last last shot at it. And that's what I thought. And as I worked with this editor, I learned so much about writing concisely, um, getting my point across. She cut, I had an 80,000 word manuscript. 
she cut 20,000 words. Can you imagine? She cut 20,000 words out of my book. It's like, oh, you could just cut off a quarter of the book. And I thought, I quit. I can't do this. She's she's ruining my book. And then it seemed to me, uh, I better very highly recommended. And she had written her own book about a very difficult um, experience she had w with having a, a child and her child had, had passed away. Um, so she knew what she was talking about. I, I, I believe somewhere inside me that she knew what she was talking about. And, and she was also came with good credentials. She had taught, she taught, um, I think she taught in, at UCLA creative writing. Um, but it was, it was astounding. I think we ended up spending 30 hours working together, which was several thousand dollars. <laughs> And, and then I thought, if I never get a publish, at least I did. I had a good time with this writing class because I was learning. Um, and every time I received feedback from her, I thought, oh my God, she's she's cutting cutting more. And she's going, I'm cutting like when you're trimming a tree to make new growth. And I loved that she said that. That was very powerful to hear that. Um, so I made a lot of mistakes in in, in trying to get this done, but... Uh, hooray, it, it happened. And I could read, um, I could read a little portion of my book. Um, and this one, this, this piece, part of this is a chapter from my book and it just received honorable mention for the women on writing contest. They have a quarterly contest and they, they awarded the, the story honorable mention, but I'm just going to read like two or three paragraphs of it. And it's the chapter is called Detours. And it's one of my favorite chapters. So here it goes. One morning, I met a woman in the changing room at the pool where Jessica did some of her physical therapy sessions. The young woman lifted her child's shirt over his head, then tied the drawstring of his blue bathing suit. They both had the hair, the color of burnt, of burnt orange sunset. Hers tumbled over her shoulders like rusty water. She smiled at me and said, we're here for swimming therapy, are you? Yes, is this your first time, I asked, as I finished pulling the bathing suit straps over Jessica's shoulders. No, we've been here for a few months. I'm Isabel. The other mother lifted her child onto her hip. She extended a hand. The little boy had a moon-shaped face that flattened across the bridge of his nose. He had dark, almond-shaped eyes. Isabel glanced at him and smoothed his hair with her palm, then kissed his head. This is my son, Nolan. He has Down syndrome. I prayed I hadn't stared and wondered if she was used to the way people responded. We walked out of the changing room together, carrying our children. Isabel told me that Nolan was two and a half, but he hadn't yet learned to walk. She heaved him to her opposite hip. At that exact moment, Nolan yanked the top of her blue and white striped bathing suit and exposed her breast. Isabel squealed with laughter, then unhooked his grip. Nolan chortled as she shook her head. She said he knew what he was doing, that he liked testing her. I laughed along with her, then told her about my twins, about how Jessica was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. I talked about how Sarah walked seven months before Jessica, that Jessica didn't walk until she was 19 months and was still kind of wobbly, and that I had to carry her whenever I was in a hurry. Nolan happily babbled as we carried our children toward the pool. I searched Isabel's face for some sign of unease and found nothing. Her pride in him radiated. For a moment, I flooded with envy. She seemed to say to the world, her child was perfect the way he was. And that's just a little part of my chapter. Um, and let's see. And my story, in, in my writing, I also have been asked about my relationship with my mother, that my own relationship with my mother growing up and how, what kind of effect that had on me and how I parented. And it's interesting to explore. I had a kind of a critical mother um, and she was, 
she was a bit reserved, quite a bit reserved. And it had a long lasting effect on me. And the, um, I really felt frustrated about my daughter's uh, diagnosis, but I wasn't, I was, it wasn't hard to dig in and think about the conflicted feelings about my childhood and how that shaped me as a mother. And I kept circling back to my roots when I was writing and thinking about my mother and my, my parents and the backstory. And in the early drafts <laughs> that some of them like got caught with those 20,000 words, um, I was writing about the history of my mother and, and myself. And I was unabashed and even at times a little bit brutal and I had to explore the forces of family influence. Um, my mother perhaps believed criticism would make me stronger, but for years it didn't have that effect at, at the reverse because what I absorbed was um, defensiveness and poor self-esteem. So there was a lot to untangle. And when I was writing, I had to stare down my harsh inner critic and I've always had difficulty accepting praise or compliments, but becoming my daughter's advocate helped me master social anxiety. And I like the person I've become. And I'm proud that I was able to transcend um, the past. And um, so I use the experiences with my own mother to model who I wanted to be once I was old enough to become a parent. And I, I, I might write another book about my own mother and what influenced her or made her reluctant to show affection. Because in my opinion, it's a mother's duty to make her children feel unconditional love and, and a parent. As a result of having a critical mother, I decided I would be entirely different. And I was aware of the power of her influence and it's still, you know, I still feel some of her judgments coming through. Well, often, especially in those early years when I was writing the, when I was not writing the book, when I was raising my daughter, um, I could feel, uh, yeah, you're, you're not, this is not how you should be acting. Uh, you know, my attitude. Um, my next book is going to probably be focused on delving into this topic of mothers because it's so interesting to me. And I no longer feel guilty when I say, I secretly say, that my mother was the wicked witch of the West in disguise. And she's she's no longer with us. So the funny thing is she resembled that actress that was in that role of the wicked witch. Um, and not all women have the biological imperative to be a mother, but I wanted to prove I was a good one. And that's what I'm going to explore in my next um when I get started on writing the next book. And uh, I hope, I hope every readers read, people read it and find it. Um, I, I'm, I'm on Amazon. I'm on, I'm on everywhere. I'm book bub, book siren. I'm well, there, I don't think I'm book siren. I'm on book bub. I'm on Barnes and Noble. Um, you can even visit my press, Fine Leaves Press and find the book. And um, actually I think they're encouraging um, readers to uh, buy the book directly from them and they're, they're, the name of their press is Vineley's Press and you can find my book there.